Hi, I'm Brian V at Why We Work. And today I have the pleasure of speaking to you with Mr. Leroy Washington, the CEO of Quest Nation FM, radio personality, music producer, and artist. He is a mentor and podcast host known as The Novelist. He's an army veteran and he has a passion and his passion not only in music for himself, but to shine light on those up and coming in the industry. Listen to him as he explains his idea and work ethic as he goes through this journey. I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. And I have the great pleasure of speaking to you today with Mr. Leroy Washington. Good day, fine sir. How are you doing? I'm doing well. You and I have been playing tag here the last few weeks because I think first and foremost, you're a busy man. Yep, pretty busy. You got thing you got things going on. Can you can you give us a little introduction to yourself, but also then we're gonna go back and, and talk a little bit about your first work experiences. I'm a military vet. Um, since I've been out of the military, just been um, just just uh, working. Started the podcast in 2015, uh, Quest Nation, uh, which I spotlight uh, uh artists, uh, underground and um, underground artists, and been working uh, as a mentor to young people for maybe the last 15, 20 years. You mentioned work. What was your first job, Leroy? Your very first job? Uh, the summer before my senior year, I worked, uh, had a job uh, as a, a janitor. You know, just doing light janitorial work. With this high school. Uh, ju uh, junior year, uh, senior year of high school, okay? Hmm? Excuse me? Was this, you said senior year, is this of high school, yes? The summer before my senior year. Summer before your senior year. And yeah. why, did, why did you, like, coming from Canada, was Canada and the U.S. are similar, right? Like, I spoke to a guy the other day. He said, well, my first official job was jumping in the pond and grabbing balls from a golf course and selling them, right? And I spoke mm -hmm. to someone else the other day, and he was like 5'10", hustling on the street, just playing some music on the street. So some people make some money early. You're looking at in the high school. That not that a little bit late, later than what most North American people experience? Or was there a reason for that? Or were you doing something else as well? Well, I made money. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, that's basically hustle. But I mean, as far as when you say my job, yeah, I yeah. Meant, uh, I'm thinking you meant, uh, well, I got a paycheck. But yeah, of course, growing up, you know, I uh, uh, shoveled snow for the neighbors, made some yeah. money. Uh, cut grass, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that's all important, right? Like this, this show is talking about, you know, especially if it comes upon the ears of kids who are wondering how they can make that same guy I said about getting golf balls. He was also making lemonade, right? That's not an official paycheck, but you know, standing on the street corner playing a violin, that's not an official paycheck either, but it shows that there's an initiative that there's a desire to work. So when you start shoveling, what was what was some of your desire? What was your motivation to get out there and make your own money? I don't think I thought of it that deep. You know, uh, yeah. just was, uh, helping out my neighbors and uh, just have a little money for, for uh, pocket change. You know, uh, so it wasn't it wasn't that deep for me. So when you got into just your summer before your senior year, what was the motivation then to there was a reason you were getting a, a real job. What was, what were you doing yeah. then? That's when I was starting to understand money a little bit more. So I wanted to be able to buy my own school clothes. Yeah. You know, my own back to school clothes and things like that. So that's why I got a job, you know. Plus How a long? Good friend, he, he hooked me up. So I was working with one of my best friends. Uh, so that, that was an extra bonus. How long did you, li did you work in that job? Just, just the summer. Just the summer, summer months. Did mm -hmm. you get any more jobs before you finished high school? Uh, no. What did you do after high school? Went into the military. 
now, yeah, you said you're a military veteran and I thank you mm -hmm. for your service. I said this to someone and it's true. We're from Canada and we owe a lot to American military soldiers, right? Because yeah. without you guys, we don't have a big brother. Why okay. did you, did you have someone in your family that pointed you towards that or you saw that as a good opportunity? What, what reason did you choose to go to the military? I think I just saw it as a good opportunity to get out and uh, experience the world. So uh, I, I actually signed up the senior the, the summer before my uh, senior year. So my whole senior year, I was already committed to go. What, I, I'm in Korea and I have, uh, I experienced the boys or the men have to do two years military service. And mm. I, you know, I've taught students who are, you know, looking not um, in a positive light towards going to the military, but they know they have to do it. If you're signing up in your senior year, how did you feel about, like, was this, was this a, a glimmering hope to something new or were you a little bit apprehensive or scared or nervous about going into it? No, I wasn't nervous because I signed up on my own free will. And we, you know, we didn't have to sign up, you know, but I just I signed up to go. Just wanted to, I guess, get the kickstart after after graduation, get out and experience life, and uh, experience new things. So, uh, and then it, it definitely helped. Did you have any friends also sign up too at the same time, or are you just solo? You're like, I'm gonna go do this. I had a friend that signed up as well. He wanted to go on the buddy system, but he wanted to go into the Marines, and I, I, would, I didn't want to do Marines. So, what did so, you sign up to? Well, I went into the Army. And what was your position that you were signing up for? I'm, I'm a little ignorant to the military, but what were you, you aiming to be as you signed up? I went in as a petroleum supply specialist. So I was able to learn how to fuel uh, aircrafts and all manner of vehicles in a wartime situation. You know, break down, uh, you know, camouflage ourselves, uh, you know, build up our fuel station and refuel tanks, you know, jeeps, helicopters everything and then I'll uh, break it down and move on you know so that was my my job i look I now i look now at people who join the military out of high school with great admiration not only because they're in the military but when i but when i was in high school i was an idiot I had no focus. I had no direction. I didn't know what I was going to do. But looking back, like, I know there's some people who joined the military and they're retired now. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, you know, I'm like, oh, I, I should have done that. How could you? So for me, I still was all over the map after high school for many years. So could you see the, the difference of how you may have thought in high school versus? getting from what I understand uh, from the military is a rude awakening to real life. Was that a, a shock for you? Was that difficult or were you able to, as they say, you know, fall in line and, and, and do whatever needs to be done to get your job done? Well, it was a shock going into boot camp and have people yelling at you <laughs> in your face. You know, that was a, that was a culture shock right there. I <laughs> I mean, as soon as we got off the bus, some of them started, you know, so, yeah. And some people was able to deal with it, some people weren't, you know. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm, I got many stories from boot camp alone before we even graduated and went off into our, uh, into our professions in the military, you know. I'm glad I did it, though. Was it tough? Like, did you just want to haul off and crack someone right in the nose? <laughs> I, had a, I had a drill sergeant named Sergeant Carter. He was a short guy. And uh, his drill sergeant has to be pressed up against my nose <laughs> as he was yelling and cussing me out. And I wanted to, I wanted to crack him one, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> I, I really did, but you know, uh, <laughs> later on, you know, w w once uh, you know, because boot camp is eight weeks, you know, and uh, so I mean, the, the first six weeks are tough. So you know, the later on, maybe like another week or two, we'll wind down, getting ready for graduation, everything kind of mellows out a little bit. 
I kind of understood why he on me so tough, but he was he was on my, you know. But I appreciated it later on. <laughs> you did, you did. <laughs> did you say thank you to him after? <laughs> Maybe yeah, not. yeah. I said I told him thank really? you. Know. Was... Yeah, he was tired of the car. I never hit him. He was something else. So he was a black guy, but he looked like a Chinese. He had the real fine, fine eyes. He, he was just not letting you in. He had, the, he had the real thin eyes, but he was a black guy. But he kind of, he, he like, kind of looked like a Chinese guy. But he was, this was on my butt all the time, you know. Yeah, the the those sergeants, they don't. <laughs> a lot of people don't appreciate them during the time. I couldn't imagine, especially right out of high school, right? Like, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, we're we're in uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, which they called that base Fort Lost in the Wood because it was like the middle of. Uh, <laughs> the wilderness somewhere and uh, you know when we're doing push-ups um, you know the ground is like it was like so hot there the ground is I feel like it's 100 degrees and you're, you're you're doing push-ups and doing mountain climbers and everything uh yeah we <laughs> it was it was pretty pretty good experience man it was, it was pretty nice stuff. okay what what did you do <laughs> what did you do but as you got your job after the eight weeks did you start to enjoy it yeah. at all? Like, was it, you're like, this oh, ain't. Man, we had a, had a ball. Yeah. yeah. From there, I went to Fort Lee, Virginia, which was a party time. And uh, that's, that's where you go, uh, basically, for school. So now you're yeah. doing, like, another eight, learning more of your craft. Yeah. And you're going, you know, like, like classroom setting, you know, and, and doing hands-on, learning your craft and everything. Uh, you know, that was, that was pretty cool. You know, and so, I mean. You get to do whatever you want to do after flock, just like a regular, just like in civilian life. Weekends off. So uh, I had a pretty good time in Fort Lee. Once uh, we graduated from there, I went to my main my main uh, duty station was Fort Hood, Texas. Hmm. And Fort Hood, Texas was an unbelievable experience for me. I've been there, actually. My I have family in Texas, we went to Fort Hood. And- yeah. And I'm post there. What what do you take out of the military experience? What is what is one kind of nugget you can take out of there that you you would even pass on to other people to say why, you know, it would be good for someone to join? That uh, everybody talks about, you know, gives you uh, it gives you uh, the word that's escaping me right now. Discipline. Discipline. Yeah, it gives you yeah. discipline. Uh, and it did that for me, but for me also, a big thing was it helped me to be able to get along with everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, all all races, people who you know who, who weren't, who didn't just look like me. You know, when, yeah. when I got to Fort Hood, uh, two of my best friends that became my best friends was a white guy named Erickson and a, and a, uh, a Puerto Rican guy named Sanchez. We all roomed together. So yeah. as we uh. As we went through our military experience, you know, I'd be playing Run DMC and LL Cool J. They'd be Sanchez was a Bon Jovi guy, you know, and uh, they would probably be playing some some Def Leppard or something. But all the different kind of music, everything, we all started to take from each other, and uh, you know, it really opened my mind up and, and helped me now. So I can I can tell anybody I, I, I love and, and work with anybody, now, you know, and don't have no prejudice like that. And that's what one thing that the military helped help uh for me. Because the guy who had your back you know, necessarily wasn't the same color as you, you know, but we were all brothers. Yeah. And that's that's the big thing for me. Yeah, that's what I hear about the military and that's that's a thing that should be praised more often. When did music oh, yeah. when did music become a mainstay in your life? Because I would say that knowing a little bit about you and your background and as you mentioned uh, producer and you make music you have some of your own albums um, when did music become a part I'm sure it wasn't just after the military but when did music become central to your life or a major part probably like my second year in, uh, a young man named Tony Bart was from New York he was a rapper he came into the uh, he, he came to the base and became part of our company and uh, so we became best friends, you know. And um, you know, he was he was pretty. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't rapping time. Uh, did uh, really know how, but I was a great writer. Mm-hmm. And uh, hanging around, I got into rap. And um, 
I remember uh, we used to we used to go in the, into the captain's office and uh, just do little little skits for him, you know, rap stuff. The captain loved it, so he signed us up big, this big um some some big extravagant uh, program they was having. It was the Christmas time. Mm-hmm. Nothing but captains, majors, all big high ranking people there with their with their family. Um, and Bartley had a, a we we were supposed to perform together. He had something happen at home to go home or on emergency leave or something. So that left me there by myself. He pulled the shoot on you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I performed that and I did a great job. But that's, I think that's when I got birth as a, as an MC, just uh, being scared with that yeah. many people in the room. Yeah. It, it, was, it, was a, it was a huge uh, ballroom. And, but, you know, being up there by myself, uh, having, to, having to do my thing, uh, that really kind of birthed me. And uh, I've been going ever since. You said you, you were writing before you began rapping. When did you start writing and how did I was that... always a great writer, yeah. When did when literature did you... in, in school? When did you start writing and what were you writing at that time? Uh, I, was, I was writing uh being raps and rhymes and ice like stories all the time. Like uh, you know, just uh yeah, just like short stories. I love to write. Who who is some of the your biggest influences when you first start writing rap when you were younger, or even some of your short stories? My influences. Uh, uh, growing up, I used to read a lot of. Uh, I love Sherlock Holmes. So I used to read uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, um, Nancy Drew mysteries. Uh, you know, I used to always read, uh, read the mystery books. You know, the little mis novels and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then as far as with the rappers, uh, you know, of course, Eric, Eric Kim, LL Cool J, Run DMC. You know, those are the the, the people who changed my life as I was uh, coming up. You know, so I started to fall in love with rap music. I, I knowing I was going to talk to you, this always comes up to me. When I was, it was, must have been 1988. I was in a little town, Myra Gut. Nova Scotia, Canada, the f- almost as far east as you can get besides Newfoundland. And I was okay. playing and I was only, what, maybe 10. And there was yeah. this, this family there with a big Winnebago. Like, what, I, I don't know if they even call Winnebagos, but the things that you connect under the back. I'm pretty sure it connected, but it was huge. And I, we must have been playing. And this kid, he must have been a little bit older than me, handed me a tape, a cassette tape. And it was... It was a, I don't even, what do we call them when we uh, record it over them? He recorded it. He, I would say, downloaded it. I don't even remember what we used to do with them. But it was a, 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 what is it called when you record the tape off of another tape? Copy? Yeah, you copied the tape or something? It was a copy. I forget what the word is. Um, But it was NWA. Mm. My whole life changed. Right? It just, it just the the way I lived, and then that became my like as you mentioned the guys that you hung out with, the guys I was hanging out with in that small little town. They were listening to like a Bon Jovi or maybe a Metallica or any of that, and then I was given that tape, and then that changed my course of music taste for the rest of my life. Oh, just, okay, those so you, those you like it right away. Oh. <laughs> I'm easy E. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, easy E. Oh, okay. Is it? But it, yeah. no, it, just, it certainly it was, did. It, was, it, was it just, it just certainly, and it gave, I had that same, like, I would say attitude, you know, I'm just a little man. <laughs> and I just yeah, follow. Yeah. Um, and it just changed the course of my life. And it gave me a different perspective on music and how you can express yourself. Mm. Any of those raps that you first wrote or short stories did you carry into recording did you you bring them forward or edit them forward and because now out of the military or even did you rap them in the military did you bring them forward and you know make them fine-tune them no no just uh the uh the rhyme that i performed at the uh at the big gala thing uh it was a, it was a uh, rap called Ghost in the Night. So this it didn't have nothing to do with Christmas or anything. It was kind of a eerie, uh, uh, walking dead type of uh, uh, story I did. 
Yeah. But I didn't have that was all I had. Uh, my, yeah. my partner had, he, he went home. <laughs> he so that's all I had. So I had to uh, I just had to do it. But you know, everybody loved it. You know, uh, everybody loved it. So uh, I seen people getting up dancing and everything. So it was, it was great. And there was some extra pressure because the young lady on, that went on before me, I closed the whole thing, but the young lady that went on before she sang uh Whitney Houston, you give good love. That's so Whitney was just burning out, you know. And this young lady did a great job. I'm like, man, I'm gonna follow her. But uh <laughs> I did. It was it was pretty good. After you hmm. finished the military, how did your career start to change? Well, uh my best friend at home, he was uh he was a good DJ. You know, he used to scratch and make everything. So we started we called ourselves the demolition posse. And uh, we started uh, doing rhymes and everything, and we was performing. And we were very successful underground uh, circuits, you know, because Milwaukee wasn't known at the time, with, well, no time like that, like it is now with music, and we didn't have the internet and everything where we, you know, showcase our music. You know, we had to go to the radio station, and you know, radio station, especially in Milwaukee, they uh, uh, it wasn't hard to, we wouldn't easy get get your music played, you know. You had to know somebody and all that. So uh, we uh, we we did secular music. Then we we had our most success doing a uh, gospel. We went gospel maybe uh around nineteen ninety. Yeah. Uh, we called ourselves Forgiven, and that's when we were uh, selling out places, uh, cathedrals, uh, YMCA's, just uh, doing music that were that inspired other young people. Mm-hmm. And we had a you know had a, had a great time doing that. You know. So are, are you still, you are still making your music, but did you continue with that for a while and then started into producing and then your mentoring? How did that become more prevalent in your life? Well, I, um, I started driving a school bus in 2002. Then started working in the public schools in 2000, mm-hmm. around 2005. So. I wasn't doing music anymore, uh, but uh, you know I was uh, mentoring people and I was coaching basketball. And uh, I uh, had I started a couple of uh, young young singing groups while I was in, while I was in school, while I was uh, working in the school. A uh, group called Driven. It was, it was like six young ladies. I had six young men that was in the group, but they all got cold feet, so I just stuck with the young ladies. So uh, they uh. They they had they had the time lives, you know. Uh, you know, I had them set up to where they were going to be doing big things. But you're talking about middle school and young ladies; they just really couldn't grasp what what they could have uh, been, you know. And and it seemed like every year a group of kids would come up to me and, Mister Washington, we want to do music, so I'd have another group, and it just became a, a yearly thing. Uh, yeah, so 2015, I started Quest Nation. Uh, for young people who didn't have an opportunity to to have the spotlight shine shine on them, where there was music, where there was just them being great in school or athletics or whatever, so I started Quest Station in 2015, so I could uh, spotlight anybody who was doing something positive with the city. So I wonder, Leroy, you said you before you got your job at the school board, you stopped music, and then you jumped into starting Quest Nation. What what made you stop? initially what was the reason so i guess you guys were busy doing it and then for some reason you stopped what what was the the main reason why you stopped being and producing music well my dj who was a who i've done music with all my life he just kind of slowed down you know he nobody really worked harder than him but he kind of slowed down so i didn't really uh i never really worked with nobody else before until now but uh when he slowed down and everything slowed down on that end, I just stopped. Is it a hard grind too, though? Is that is that part of the reason, like not just slowing down for no reason, but it's 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 a hard haul it, to try to make it. It is, but when it's uh, something you love, uh, I don't think it's that hard because there's there's people who are underground who still make a good living doing it. You can still make a good living doing music. You don't have to be a uh, somebody who's in the top 40 of, you know, somebody who's well known. But uh, maybe it's other reasons, you know, he, he he still hasn't come around really, you know, he's uh, he's admiring what I'm doing, but uh, 
you know, I guess uh, when something happens on the inside, when you just want to go a different direction, that's, uh, that's just what it is. So what is Quest Nation then? What is it you provide or what is it you do? A spotlight artist, a spotlight people who's, uh, who got something to say, who, like I said, whether you're uh, a singer or somebody from, from a small town and you, know, you want to get heard, uh, I interview you and uh, spotlight your music. And I've had people who uh, who have gotten record deals because of me. Um, or uh, I talk to college professors. I, I do paranormal shows. I do Quest Nation. It's everything now. We just we just have a great conversation, and uh, you know I have a pretty good following. So I'm having the time of my life doing it. With new artists that you experience, what is some of the difficulties? Maybe they should maybe work out before they come to you or something they should consider before coming to you so that you too, or if it's a group, the group of you can work together and make it successful for them. How, what is something that it's difficult for these artists to initially deal with almost like going say in the military or meeting, not that you're the sergeant, but just like there's a brutal wake up call to when they start taking this more seriously. What, what is something that they should probably know before getting into music more seriously? That's that they have to work hard to um, perfect their craft. You know, I'm just here to, um, I'm just here to sh- uh, shine a, a spotlight on them. Yeah. You know, um, so I'm not, they're not necessarily under my umbrella. You know, I have some that's in, that's in my hometown that I work with more closely. And then there's some uh, nationwide, like uh, my, my man Griff, who's in Toronto, Canada, who I work with real close. We've done three songs together. But uh, for the most part, you know, I'm just here to give, uh, give, give some of these young people a chance that I never had. You know, when we were hot back in the 80s, we didn't you know. Um, it was hard for the world to hear us, to hear what we could do. And we were doing stuff that, that was just as hot as on, what was on the radio. Yeah. So I said I would do my part to, to give these young people, uh, you know, uh, a platform that people could hear their, their music. And it's worked out for a lot of them. You said the work is what they have to put in. What is the hardest part about being a musician? What is What is the hardest thing that, you know, maybe it's not the singing, maybe you know, it's the promoting or what is it hard for them to do to, to step up to? I don't know, maybe right now is a, would be a, just the business side of it, you know, finding, a, you know, making the right choices, finding a record label or somebody to work with, manager, management, stuff like that. Uh, you have to make the right choices. You know, we, we made a bad choice. Um, we signed with a, with, with a label that, um, kind of drained the years out of, out of, out of us, you know, when we were, we were uh, on top, we were hot and we could have been uh, a mainstream name by now, but uh, we made the mistake of seeing this, uh, this record label and they had all the, they had the, all the big equipment and everything. Uh, but the personalities and the people in that, in, in, in that uh, record label just wasn't meant for us, you know, and uh, we made a mistake. So, Hopefully, a lot of young people don't make that same mistake. And you spent a lot of time with them, so that took that drained away where you could have been putting your energy somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. They they wanted to do um. the 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 owner of that label really was into into gospel music and into singing. You know, uh, wasn't really too much uh, into rap too much. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, one thing that uh. My my guy Jay could do, you know. I told you he was a DJ, but he could he could play music by ear. So he became very popular with that uh, with that record label because he could play music. Mm. And so he they used him a lot as far as with uh, some singing artists and everything like that. So that kind of left me in the cold. Uh, but um, me being a songwriter, they brought me in on some a lot of projects as well because they knew nobody could write like me. But as far as our projects together, what we were doing. As as a forgiven, and then we was prime example. Later on, um, the record label didn't really have any plans on. We were kind of on the on the back of the back burner. So I would know. I wish we would have uh, maybe did a little more research and, and and got with a label who would have understood the power of hip hop and, and what we what we were bringing to the table. 
and uh, we, it could have been a different out, outcome. I think that's good advice you give there just in passing is do some of the research because probably yeah. when we were younger, this sort of ability to research was not available to us. Right? We, can, we have Google. Yeah. Right. Without having to like beat the streets and to, you know, find out who's who and not really know who they are. Like we have reviews and people have LinkedIn and they have all sorts of things to find out who they are. We can yeah. probably for the, your artists is to, or anyone else listening is to do some of that research. Right. And there's a lot Ooh. of it that's free. And unfortunately I think you make a really good point for a mentor who you're mentoring is we didn't have this information as easily, right? It was kind of held for an upper echelon of people who probably had people working for them to get the information. And for right. you know, an up and coming person, it, it makes it nowadays much more easy to, yeah. to not have to you know, reinvent the wheel. Right. What are you doing now, Leroy? What, is, what takes up your time? What, besides Quest Nation, what else is on your plate? I have a um, EP that's coming out on September fifteenth, September fourteenth. That's my birthday, uh, so next month. And what is it's it called? Final ingredient. Final ingredient. Yeah, so it's like a six, seven song EP. Uh, got some great music on there. Feature. I'm featuring some great young artists on the songs with me, and uh, some international talent. I got some uh, Dan Medina, who's a lead rock. Uh, uh, lead singer of this rock band called Gravity. He's from Krakow, Poland. He's doing a couple of songs. Uh, my guy Griff from Toronto, Canada, who used to be uh, down with Drake. Um, so I got it's a lot of flavor on this uh, on this EP. It's gonna be nice. How does it feel? Like you think <laughs> you're back in the military up there, you know, rapping a song because you got your friend pulled shoot on you, so scared, and now you got an EP coming out after even stopping quitting maybe what you thought initially stopping music and then now you got something coming out on your birthday it was good it feels feels real good I and uh, like I said, it wasn't his fault that he had to leave but uh this yeah, this yeah. was uh, bad timing and but you know i made the i made the most out of it i remember uh somebody gave me good advice said don't look at no don't look at anybody so when I'm on stage, I'm I'm not what looking at look what looking nobody in the face. I just focused on something in the back of the in the back of the ballroom. But then in my peripheral vision, I could see people getting up, dancing, and that loosened me up. And then uh, so uh, then after that, we just it was just fun. Just had a, had a great time. How long does that process take of making an EP from? So you it's coming out in a couple of weeks. How long from yeah. the beginning of that? That process. Well, I started. Uh, was that last summer? Yeah, summer two thousand and nineteen. I started it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two thousand nineteen. I started. So probably about a uh, maybe five six months, uh, maybe a little longer. But you know the the process has stopped a little. Bit, had stopped. So as of lately, the last. Uh, I mean, I do, I've done like the last three songs in like a, maybe a little over a month. So mm -hmm. it, it picked up really quick. In this process of making an EP, especially you're getting other artists, you're getting other mm -hmm. things in line. What is most difficult doing that? What is hardest? now? Because within the last year you've been doing it, you had some stoppages. Probably Corona didn't help. Right. But no, I didn't help at all. What what is most difficult about putting this together and how you know putting a bow on it and ready to distribute it to people? What is the hardest process in this? Well, um, just getting everybody in the studio. But I, but me personally, I didn't experience anything hard. Everybody wanted just wanted to really was excited to get on with me, you know, because they they I have a little reputation, so. Uh, Everybody showed up. Everything, everything was good. The, the hardest part, which really, really wasn't hard, was these last three songs. So you talked about me sending a beat uh, through the email to Toronto, Canada, to them, and me just uh, then sending my vocals, and I'm not in the studio with them. I'm telling them what I want done, and uh, then having to wait 
on the day that they're doing it for them to send me a sample back so that I know that it's all good. Well, that can be a little stress. You know, I'm used to being in the studio. So the first three songs that we got completed, I was in the studio with everybody here in Milwaukee. These last three songs was done in, in another country. So I have to, you know, I'm kind of have to wait and see if, if all my wishes was taken care of. And sometimes it wasn't. And we have to you know, do it again. You know, so that was the tough part, you know. And then this last song, if I do it, uh, this is uh, United Kingdom. <coughs> yeah, from the United Kingdom. Uh, so, well, I've learned a lot, you know. And, and, and it's just a lot about technology nowadays, too, that you don't even have to be in the same country. You can still uh, record together. It sound like you all there in the same studio together. But, yeah, I've been listening to some things about music, and it's the idea of, that is becoming more a reality. Like you could lay down something and never see the person. Right. That That's pretty interesting. Like, and it's, it's efficient too, right? You don't have, but as you said, it's probably really nice to be in a studio with people. It's like a different sort of atmosphere, but it comes down to trusting that process. And that must be difficult, right? You do your part. Now you're waiting for someone you can't even see to, to put their part in and you have to trust that process. Yeah, like, cause like, uh, Griff, I know what he looks like. We, you know, we come, become really good friends now, but his engineer that has, that's engineered these last three songs, I wouldn't know him if he walked in here right now. You know, I wouldn't know him from, uh, from, from a can of paint. That's so, funny, but, you know, yeah, that is. But he's a guy who I've, last three songs, I put my trust in to make sure that, he puts me and Griff's stuff the way on there, the way we're supposed to have it. And any extra sounds or any extra instruments I want on the track, he's done that. But I don't know how he looks. It's, it's interesting. It's probably, I think, even maybe an advantage to do some work with someone you haven't met before. And then you can see their product. And then you can know them by their work that they do opposed to meeting someone and and sometimes we have this you know maybe mishap of well let's see if we can work together and getting used to each other but you guys have you got a job to do you got work to do do the work and then you have the product and you can see their their ability and their their talents right away you know one thing about the the quest nation thing that that is that has really brought it to light for me was that uh I look at a lot of artists here in my own city and you have a lot of people here who are, who are in your own town, in your own city, who may have prejudices against you or whatever because they know you because maybe something happened years mm-hmm. ago. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, mm-hmm. you took a girl to the prom, this dude wanted to take whatever. Mm-hmm. But when you're dealing with people that from other states, other countries that's from outside of your area, they just see, they just see, your heart, they see the work that you do. And if it's good, they gravitate to it. And there's no extra prejudice, there's no extra dirt in there. You know, uh, and, and that's the great thing about the Quest Nation that I've, I've come to uh, love. You know, the awards I've won have been from other other cities. California loves me. You know, uh, you know I've got offers to go to Australia and uh, Poland and places like that. You know, people out there love me because they see what I what I do, what they see it comes from the heart. Whereas somebody here in my own city may have may look at me through a dirty lens. You know what I'm saying? Even though I don't it's kind of just the way it is. It's unfortunate. I mean, there's lots of historical things that say about being hated in your own land. You talk about being forgiven. <laughs> That's biblical too. <laughs> That's biblical. The Bible says talks about that too. <laughs> That's what I was referring to but it's horrible right like you know i have a lot of love here in milwaukee but, uh, but some of the other people who's kind of like you're considered some of the movers and shakers like me mm-hmm. it's hard for us to get together and do something and i've noticed that you know but i can get the other other movers and shakers who's doing great things in their cities and they want me to come or fly me out and everything so it is what it is i'm 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 i'm, I'm good with it it's unfortunate, right? Like, I don't want to dwell on it, but like, you can just say you're from this town and people are like, oh, you're from that town. But people outside of the state or outside of the country, yeah. they have no idea, right? Like, it may not have anything to do with you, but you're from this town. 
Oh yeah. yeah, I know what you're like. No, you don't. No, you yeah. don't. Right. right. Really nice to be able to show your work, and it's just your work, and then you can get rid of all that noise off to the side. That's right. In your mentoring, what it what is the you know the beautiful thing that you're able to take from your mentoring that you're doing through your Quest Nation and all around. I'm sure you're, you're not one that only does it for this. If you see someone that you're able to mentor, you're, you take them under your wing. What is the beautiful thing that you can, you're taking from this experience of mentoring, knowing, you know, when you came out of high school and into the military, both of us, we've grown up, we've learned a lot of things and you're able to impart some wisdom and experience to these kids. What is it that you're taking from this most of all? Well, I just think that, um, making everybody uh, feel important and people know that, uh, you know, uh, your voice out here matters, you know, your, your, your music matters as long as it's coming from the heart. Uh, and even some, some who I may have on who I don't think, uh, their sound is really ready. I uh, really, I've had people on who I didn't really think their music really that great or whatever, but they believe in it. So if they believe in it, I'm up in it with you because I don't, I don't know where God will take you a year from now. You now you may be to somebody totally on another level. Um, like this one young lady, um, she, she, um, hit me up and said that she cried as she listened to the interview when I, when I finished with it and uh, she listened to it. She cried the whole way through because it, it, it really gave her, it really boosted her spirits. Mm-hmm. And, um, if I could do that for that, that, just so that one person, uh, it, it's worth it, you know, because she was down in the dumps about, about her music and everything and I gave it, nobody else would, uh, give her a chance. And I gave her a chance to put her on and it meant so much to her. Right? That is something that stays with me. Definitely. Like- so you can't judge people, uh, you know, they might be, they may not be that great in your opinion, but you never know where they, where they can, uh, where they can go a year from now. And they will look back. And I learned at that. that, you know, I learned that uh, years ago. I was at a work at a job. And, yeah. and a young lady was um uh, uh she was uh selling a cassette tape of a husband and wife uh t- duo who uh were at, was at her church had their first tape out. And uh she let me take it home. I didn't money at the time on me. I said I'll bring it to work tomorrow. Say okay, just take it home. If you want it, uh, buy it tomorrow. Took it home. There was nothing on it that I liked. To to me, the whole thing was just ugh. Mm-hmm. But I I brought the money back the next day, and I, and I bought the, the cassette tape. You know, and this long story short, uh, I, I run into the guy uh, who was part of that husband wife duo years ago, years later when I'm mm-hmm. working in uh, the Milwaukee public school system. No, uh, it's it's that guy, and uh, and I hear some of his music, their music now, and it's much better. And so, I'm, so that just showed me that you know you never know how God will take you. You might not be that today, but tomorrow you may be something special. So I'm not going to uh, turn any any artist. In. It's not only that too. I think there's a deeper thing going on when some of these kids may not be getting some attention. And you're showing them, you know, giving them an ear, listening to that they may not even get at home. And while they may pursue a path of music, it's just giving, listening to them and giving them a chance. And them, you know, as you said, the girl that was crying, listening to something that she, she did, that you gave her that opportunity. Yeah. And she, that might give her some, a boost of confidence for something else. Like, right. it's, it's pretty amazing. I think it's really good that we need more mentors like yourself, and we should all step up and mentor in whatever way we have a capacity to do. So I, I appreciate what you're doing. That's, that's right. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. So in what you're doing now, how would you say that from your first job to now, how has work brought you through your life? Even when you're getting yelled at in the face in, in the military or you know, a buddy saying, no, I, I can't be in the group anymore, but you're willing to work because you even stopped music and then you started it back up. You're mentoring when you don't have to mentor. You can be just selfish and do it all for yourself and not try to help other people. How has work helped you and how do you see this as a, a silver lining through your life? 
Uh, workers help me. It's just um, if you have a job, you just you just have to do it to your best of your ability. That's what, what my parents taught me to do. You know, do your best at it. Uh, whatever job you have, uh, you know, do your best. Be on time. Be punctual. And uh, you know, do your job. <laughs> so that's that's basically how with me. I'm um, when I do when I do quests, I I do it um, whether I'm tired or whatever. I I do my job. And I give these uh these people who I'm interviewing get them my all. That same thing I would do at a job. Same thing I would do when I was in the military. And then, like I said, with the military, it helped me to be able to deal with a lot of people. So I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people who I've dealt with, uh, like a, it was a rapper from India. I never heard rap like that. In, in India rap, I never heard it like that. It just it sounded like a a cobra was going to come up at, at some point, you know, with the rapping, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that kind of sound, you know, but it helped me to be able to deal with, you know, to deal with that, you know, and uh, to understand that everybody's not the same, but, you know, at the same time, we're all God's children. So that's, that's, that's where, you know, it hit me. So. Yeah. I think if you, you have a respect for music, you can, you can appreciate any music because I'm in Korea and you hear, a lot of rap that you know i think growing up say with nwa or ll cool j we're we're thinking a little bit more harder core than what you might be hearing coming out of india or but that that's their rap right that's their poem that's their poetry that's their writing that they yeah. sat down and they're putting a track to it and for them that's what it is and i think we can appreciate what they're they're trying to accomplish and at the end it is music yeah, that's that's what they're bringing to the table. That's how they that's how feel rap, you uh, know, and no coming from their culture. So that's the beautiful thing about it, you know. So they they they're bringing that to the table. So you either can appreciate it or you can't. So I, I can appreciate that. Yeah. You know, Leroy, I've got uh, I've, I've got Go some 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 great uh, hip hop artists who uh, uh some great hip hop artists who I've listened to like Melo and Ace and those guys who uh. They they rap in Spanish and I don't understand a word saying, but I love their songs. <laughs> yeah, when Does you that hear makes a good sense. no, it does. When you hear a good beat, you hear a good it's hip, beat. It's hip, it's hip hop, right? You hear it. You hear a good beat. That maybe of course I can understand a couple words. Mm -hmm. But during the during the verse, I can't understand it. But during the chorus, I can understand a couple words, and so I uh, I love it. It's in my playlist. Like you can appreciate, right? We can appreciate it because it, you know it makes sense to someone. And if it sounds good, they're hitting it, right? Yeah. They're hitting it. Yes. Leroy, how, how do you rest? How do you rest besides your, I mean, you are busy. I know you're busy. I have, I have you up late at night and you should be going to bed. But how do you rest? How do I rest? What do you do to rest? Yeah. No, oh, how I unwind. I like to uh, like to listen to listen to some music or watch a movie. I'm a movie person. I like to watch a good movie, and um, and then I'm really into now. I'm really into um, podcasts. So I have my favorite podcast. I like to listen to they 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 take me to sleep. You know, I'm a I'm a big paranormal guy, and some of my paranormal shows are just as popular as the music ones. So uh, I have some some people who I like to listen to, and their shows just just put me in a in in a zone where I can just I can just uh, after the show I can just rest and uh, get some good sleep. Leroy, before we go, how can how can people find you? Because I know you got your new LP EP coming out. How can people yes, find um, you? Yes, on on Twitter, I'm Smooth Novelist. All one word, smooth novelist. On, uh, on Instagram, I'm novelist 2019. On LinkedIn, Leroy Washington. On uh, Facebook, I'm Roy Washington, which I, I, I use Roy to honor my, my, my dad. He used to call me Roy all the time. So that's that's my business name, too. So uh, so I'm Roy Washington on Facebook. And um, yeah, just... Uh, Hit me up, uh, inbox me. If you're somebody who's doing something who uh, want to uh, be spotlighted, uh, and we'll talk. When's your EP coming out again? And the name of it? 
of the final ingredient comes out September 14th, which is my birthday. And also my email is lp.wash at yahoo.com. Well, happy birthday. Imagine we had this stuff growing up. You just named like five to 10 different things, a way to get in contact you. We had like, call my mom's phone number. (laughs) (laughs) Like when we get a little older, you got a pager, right? But like, that's all, (laughs) what do you mean? We had nothing. (laughs) Call call my friend. I'll meet you on the corner. (laughs) Like, totally different <laughs> it's like and then and then there's next week there'll be yeah. something new we add to it Leroy I truly appreciate yeah. it Anyone watching this please subscribe to my channel click on the notifications get me a why we work Leroy I truly appreciate okay. this time and I would like to speak to you again and see yeah, how it was a great conversation man. I, I appreciate you Mr. Leroy Washington hit him up he's coming out September 14th his new EP